Guys, we'll get straight into the weekend recap, including a world tour, but there are a couple of housekeeping items to speak about, so bring it in. First off, hope you had a great weekend. Second, I released a big conversation that I had with Hercules Gomez of ESPN on Friday. Meant a lot to be able to speak with him, so check that out if you have an interest in all things CONCACAF. And finally, if you want to hear me talk MLS, then we will absolutely do that on my podcast, where we also speak about European football, South American, CONCACAF, a world tour of sorts there as well. Give us a follow linked below on the platform where you're choosing. Give us a review if you feel up to it. Leave a review and I'll kiss you. That's the policy. I'm just joking, I won't. Well, Palmeiras and their Portuguese coach Abel Ferreira have done it again for the second year running. Palmeiras are Copa Libertadores champions and they did it in their style. And just as Filippo said during the preview, they'll make the match horrible to play in as Ferreira knows what kind of match Flamengo will suffer in and they will steal a goal somewhere to win it as they've done throughout the tournament. As you guys will remember from the preview, if you saw it, Flamengo had Palmeiras number lately, but not today. When they scored five minutes in, you just knew that Palmeiras was going to turn this into a slog for Flamengo as Gustavo Gomez, who had a great game, by the way, played a stunning ball beyond Flamengo's back line. Mickey's cutback was finished off by Rafael Vega. After a lot of laboring for a goal, who else but Gabi Gol, Gabriel Barbosa, to pick things up for Flamengo from a difficult angle and make it 1-1. Extra time would be needed to settle this one. It was settled early as the substitute Daverson pounced on a horrible mistake from Man United Loni Andres Pereira and his strike managed to slip past Diego Alves. What a way to lose a final for Flamengo. Pereira won't soon forget that, that's for sure. And can't forget the shithousery from game winner Daverson. Got a pat on the back from the referee and Daverson goes down clutching his back. Ridiculous stuff from him. Also crazy to think that Abel Ferreira now has two Libertadores titles. It's unbelievable. Portuguese managers have won three finals in a row now. Once from Flamengo with uh, Jorge Zuz, twice from Abel Ferreira. Speaking of, back in Portugal, Benfica versus Belenenses was a disgrace and shouldn't have been played. Belenenses have a ridiculous COVID outbreak going on at their club, so they could name just nine players and two of them were keepers for this match. One was an outfield player and they had some children. It was crazy. It never should have gone ahead. Last season, Benfica had a crazy COVID outbreak too and were able to keep playing because Benfica has a B team. They have a deep deep squad to pull from. So I don't know what's going on over there with Belenense and why they didn't request a postponement. Apparently they didn't request one because of the game times that were available to them. The other dates weren't favorable for them. That's the rumor at least where the actual burden of responsibility lies to get this match postponed has to be with the league. It doesn't make sense for Belenense to play. There's no sporting merit in it. So why have it go ahead? Benfica were scoring goals for fun in the first half, 7-0 by the time halftime came. Nobody was celebrating. Nobody was enjoying it. A Benfica supporter left the stadium at halftime because he said this wasn't a football game. The game was abandoned after the half. Belenense sent out seven. One of them sat down immediately saying they were injured and the match was abandoned because they have no substitutes. Embarrassing situation for the league. It really was. Over in the Premier League, we had Norwich and Wolves play out to a nil-nil draw, ensuring that Dean Smith is yet to lose a match as manager at his new club. Brighton and Leeds also played to nil-nil as Brighton are on quite the winless run now. Eight matches without securing the full three points. And they started so well, didn't they? Up there in second, third, around there. Steven Gerrard is on two wins from two in the league now. Fantastic stuff from Gerrard and Villa as they make it two on the trot with a victory away to Patrick Vieira's Crystal Palace. Ashley Young continues to be important for Gerrard, by the way, as the veteran winger, not playing as a fullback this time. On the wing, set up Matt Target with a strange corner kick. Target was at the far post and had enough time to settle the ball and then slam it in. Crystal Palace, they've conceded 10 goals from corners, so I guess it shouldn't really come as a surprise. It shows that they've conceded that many. In the second half against the run of play, John McGinn was able to grab a goal to double Villa's lead and put any worries of the surging Crystal Palace stealing a point to bet. Good thing too, as Palace scored in the 95th, but they fell 2-1. Two wins from Villa on the bounce, that bounces them all the way up to 11th, actually. Arsenal got a 2-0 victory over Newcastle United early on Saturday, as it looks like Eddie Howe will have quite the difficulty in keeping Newcastle up in the Premier League. That was always going to be what made it so difficult to convince all of those managers to take the Newcastle job. The job is just so big, the infrastructure isn't set up yet, tons of work to do there. So for Arsenal, Saka and Martinelli get the goals as they go right back to winning after that big loss against Liverpool last week. 
Speaking of Liverpool, they went right back to smashing teams 4-0 after they did so last weekend to Arsenal. This time, it took them under two minutes to score their first goal as some brilliant work from Mane and Robertson down that left flank ended with a driven pass across goal and Jota was there to finish it off. His presence in the box, his ability to just pop up and finish something off is outstanding. Driven home by his second goal, really, as he was ghosting to the back post and a great ball in from Salah made it to no. Five minutes later, deflected strike from Thiago Alcantara as he made it two matches consecutively that he scored in. This one, I mean, just a little in-step roll with his right, then he hit it on his left. Sure, there was a deflection. It was going on goal anyway, I think. The deflection ultimately made it the goal, but hey. Finally, 4-0, Alexander-Arnold finding Van Dijk, and he was able to lose Romeo, who's marker, and squeeze a volley under the keeper for four. Another solid win from Liverpool. They're not slowing down. Brentford hosted Everton, and Everton were not good, were they? Uninspiring stuff as season upon season, it gets harder to understand what Everton's identity as a sporting side is. This was no exception, and having to see Salomon Rondon as the striker is certainly not what the Toffees want to see in 2021. It's uninspiring, isn't it? Credit to Brentford, though, for getting it done and getting that win. Leicester and Watford took part in a snow battle. Burnley Tottenham, they had their snow battle called off. But Leicester and Watford had some fun out there, playing out a 4-2 win for Leicester as Rodgers tries to get their form back on track. Vardy was also close to a hat-trick. I mean, the conditions didn't help as sometimes passes were overhit to compensate for the slow roll. Sometimes the snow had less of an impact as, as thought it would. So it made it hard to judge how hard to hit a pass out there. I mean, I can relate. Growing up and playing in Canada, there's some frost that you have to play through sometimes. It, it's tough. City and West Ham had similar issues, at least in the first half. I mean, you could barely see the ball, as you can see from this image here. But City really were spectacular at times with the ball. They moved it well. But with players like Cancelo out there, it's just not fair. There's always good movement. There's always a good sprayed ball wide to guys like Mares. And his deflected strike fell on a plate to Gundogan to tuck it in for 1-0. A late goal from Fernandinho, the sub, sealed it for City, even though... Manuel Lanzini, another sub, scored a goal in the 94th. Great volley off the inside of the post in that top corner and into the back of the net. Stunning strike from him. So a good performance from City considering the opposition, one of the best clubs in the country at the moment, which set us up for Chelsea versus Manchester United from Sanford Bridge late on. Let me tell you, Timo Werner, I mean, I back the guy as much as... Uh, more than most do, in fact. Still believe in him. But after a match like this... I think he had six attempted, zero on target. Ugh. Anyway, we really didn't see much from United in this one, especially in that first half. But in the second, they stole a goal, and who else but Jaden Sancho to do it? Two matches in a row now, he scored. Horrible, horrible touch by Jorginho. Ends up costing his team. Great run and finish from Sancho. And Jorginho was left looking like this. And this basically sums up how I would feel too. But a penalty would be given later as Juan Basaka cleared the ball through kicking Thiago Silva over and Jorginho would convert making up for his earlier mistake and Chelsea nearly killed themselves late on though however they had some some bad thoughts in this match Edouard Mendy threw a ball straight to Fred but Fred and his indecision led to him just chipping it comfortably back into Mendy's arms 1-1 one, one Chelsea they stay atop the standings with just one point ahead of Man City and two ahead of Liverpool Juve continued to flounder in Italy following their beatdown at the hands of Chelsea midweek. They lost at home this weekend against Atalanta as Duvan Zapata's goal in the 28th minute was what separated the two sides in a somewhat ill-tempered affair. Nine yellow cards shown from referee Giovanni Airoldi, which is far above his average of just five per game. Yes, I did look into how many cards he gives out per game. But anyway, toward the end of Allegri's stint, his first stint with Juve, they were playing poorly, but we're still getting results over the line. Now, they're playing poorly and just don't have a difference maker in the attack. Say whatever you want about Ronaldo, the fact is that him leaving, that's about 30 or so goals that you're going to have to find from somewhere else in the squad. So it's hard to see how they turn things around at this point. The squad building at Juve just, it's been poor, hasn't it? Now this news of, you know, sketchy financial investigations into the club, it's just bad vibes. After the big victory over AC Milan last weekend, the duality of Fiorentina strikes back again, losing 2-1 to Empoli. Madness. Looking at the record, Fiorentina has seven wins and seven losses. Shows you both the good and the bad with Italiano's side so far. There's no gray areas, just black and white. 
Interstring of solid results continue for Inzaghi's side. This one in particular wasn't their best performance of the season, but they got the results, which is what, you know, they always say, if you're playing poorly and you get the result, that's the mark of a good team, right? That's what they always say. But they were made to work for their 2-0 win away to Venezia, as the newly promoted side has found some form themselves lately. And while they offered very little going forward, they defended quite well, I found. I mean, Yes, Sergio Romero was called upon many times, <laughs> that's for sure, but overall, Venezia's defending was decent. Chalanolu's long-range effort caught Romero off guard in the 34th to put Inter ahead, and a late penalty from Lotaro sealed it. Sampdoria stormed back in the second half against Hellas Verona to turn around the one-goal deficit and end up winning 3-1. Candreva with a goal and an assist, Ekdal and Muru with the others for Roberto da Versa. AC Milan put in another poor performance in Serie A this week. Last week, they were beaten 4-3 by Fiorentina, and this week, they were even worse, losing 3-1 against Sassuolo as Domenico Berardi continued his run of terrorizing AC Milan. He scored what was the third and final goal for Sassuolo, whereas before, Scamacca was making another claim for a call-up to the national team. He looks like one of the only hopes for this Italian side when it comes to filling in for Immobile when he's not available. Him and Keane, I guess. But yeah, AC Milan struggle. Romagnoli got himself sent off as he was beaten quite easily by Defrel, and then he hauled him down cynically to prevent a fourth for Sassuolo. Not good. And just 24 hours after, Pioli had signed a contract extension, I believe. So that's not how he would have liked to have marked the occasion. That's for sure. Though some checkered form in late October, early November, Roma have been getting the results lately, with their third win on the trot across all competitions coming this weekend at home against Torino. Tammy Abraham with a goal, as he scored three in his last two appearances for AS Roma. That's great stuff from him. Napoli lost last weekend and lost midweek against Spartak, as Spalletti has some figuring out to do in Osimhen's absence. The guy got a horrible facial injury, shattered some of his orbital bone, nasty stuff, likely out till February or so. But at home against Lazio, not exactly the easiest team in the world, they eased to a victory, 4-0. They had themselves up 2-0 by the time the 10th minute came around. Dries Mertens had a first half brace to make it 3-0 going into the half, and a late strike in this match from Fabian Ruiz killed off Sarri's men 4-0. So, with AC Milan slipping, Napoli are the lone leaders once again at the top of the table with 35 points from a possible 42. Not bad from them. Inter is gaining on AC Milan, Atalanta won't go away, and Roma is circling around that top four as well. FC Barcelona went away to Villarreal this weekend, a Villarreal side that looked quite poor against Manchester United on Tuesday, and the better overall performance continued for Barcelona. Again, their Achilles heel is finishing off their chances. That's going to be a big problem for Xavi if someone doesn't catch form soon, isn't it? I mean, Memphis was scoring goals early in the season, took a little break. Thankfully for him, Memphis was able to finish his chance in the 88th minute, which was the late winner, and a 94th minute penalty from Coutinho sealed it all. Araujo solid at the back as ever. Good performance from Coutinho coming off the bench, and De Jong may be the most gifted player in that squad. After such a great start under Bordalas, Valencia has stuttered a bit lately, and this weekend was no exception, drawing 1-1 with Rayo Vallecano. I mean, respect to Rayo Vallecano, decent side. Real Batiste rolled on. They got their second consecutive win in order to keep some of the pressure on the top clubs in La Liga. They beat Levante 3-1 this weekend as a second half hat trick from Juan Mi turned around the one goal lead Levante had thanks to, here's a throwback, Shkroda Mustafi. His seventh minute goal had put Levante ahead. Atletico Madrid built on last week's victory over Osasuna with a second consecutive win in La Liga, easing to victory over Cadiz, 4-1 there. All of the goals came in the second half, with substitute Mateus Cunha in particular finally making a real mark for his new club as he got a goal and an assist. And finally, Real Madrid versus Sevilla was no doubt the match everyone would have had their eyes on. Why? Because had Sevilla won, they would have been top of the table. They would have been ahead of everybody, best of the rest. Sure, pulses were raised early on in this match as Rafa Mir scored after just 12 minutes, but Karim Benzema, Mr. Inevitable, equalized before the half was up. He's already on 11 goals and 7 assists this season, and you know who else is in incredible form still. The man who is chasing Benzema for La Liga's top scorer honors, Vinicius Jr. He took down a crossfield ball from Militão, ran inside with the ball, and wired it into the top corner for 2-1 to win the match. Bono got a piece of it, but it was a superb finish and worthy of being a match winner for Real Madrid. That was his ninth to Benzema's 11. That win keeps them on top in La Liga with a match in hand over Real Sociedad and four points ahead of Atletico Madrid as well. 
One of the really eye-catching results in the Bundesliga was Köln defeating Gladbach 4-1. I mean, what a start to the season Köln are having, aren't they? Certainly in comparison to how they ended last season in which they struggled a lot. After Jonas Hoffmann equalized in the 74th for Gladbach, Köln hit two in two minutes to make it 3-1, and an insurance goal in garbage time made it 4-1 Köln. Big win. Hoffenheim was able to get a big win over Greuther Fürth as well, who are yet to get a win in the league, actually. Yet to get a second point in the league. They're on one point. Hoffenheim quietly doing well in the league as they now sit in fifth place after their 6-3 win. Just a couple of points back of SC Freiburg, who lost away to VFL Bochum. Very surprising from them, though. I mean, you know, Bochum isn't the worst side out there, are they? Yes, their low standing in the league makes it easy to point to this being a massive surprise, but this was Bochum's fifth win. They turned some of those losses into draws, and they'd be cooking close to the top four, at least at this point. That's how tight the Bundesliga table is currently. Bayern Munich hosted Armenia Bielefeld in a match in which it was confusing as to how it was just 1-0. Bayern were truly wasteful with their opportunities in a match that they could have scored three or four goals at least in. Sané with what was the winner, his fourth of this Bundesliga season thus far. Borussia Dortmund went away to VfL Wolfsburg and with neither of the teams in great form at the moment, it was the Black Yellow who came away with a 3-1 victory. Emre Chan scored from the spot after he was sent off against Sporting midweek, which brought Dortmund level. They were behind after just two minutes after all in this match. So Chan making up for some things there. And in the second half, two things happened that Dortmund supporters would have loved to have seen. Malin scoring in three consecutive matches now, that's huge. And second, Erling Braut Holland returning from injury as a substitute and scoring after being on the pitch for seven minutes. That makes his tally, that takes his tally up to 50 Bundesliga goals and 50 Bundesliga matches, which is not bad for a 21 year old, is it? Just when it looked like Eintracht Frankfurt was heading toward a draw against Union Berlin, an 85th minute winner from Evan Indica, FIFA 20 legend, <laughs> won the match for Glasner's group 2-1. RB Leipzig, they're starting to freak me out a little bit because I can't get a read on these guys as they are just so damn inconsistent from match to match. This weekend, they hosted Bayer Leverkusen and they were beaten handily. Yes, there was a penalty from Soboslai that hit the woodwork and that would have made it 3-2 in the 87th and who knows from there. But the reality is that he failed to convert, which is a rarity from him actually. First time for everything. But yes, shout out Leverkusen, especially Musa Diaby, who was excellent once again in this side. So that win from Leverkusen ensures that the top three is the exact same deficits as last weekend with Bayern, one point ahead of Dortmund, and seven ahead of Leverkusen. And that's all, my friends. Thanks for hanging with me today, and let's hang again later this week. Take care of yourselves. Review my podcast after you listen to it, of course. Give it a follow. It will feel good. I promise you. All right, guys, thanks so much for watching and enjoy your day. Take care.